Hi, time for revival. Psalm 85 verse 6 tells us, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Someone wise once said, We cannot organize revival, but we can set our sails to catch the wind of heaven. Time for revival. Want to know more? Hang around. Welcome, welcome, take two. All right, welcome to Lions Raw 38 Ministries. My name is George Magalhães, and Amos 38 tells us a lion has roared, who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy. We are an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our passion, our mission to reignite, equip and release Christ-like disciples both locally and globally. We do that through our itinerant ministry but as well as providing with resources just like this one to help you, to aid you in your God-given calling. Today we're going to talk about something that is on the lips of everybody and I mean everybody that is at least half awake it's all over. It's happening all over the world. It's, it's, it's gone viral. And everybody's talking about this. Not a specific place as such, even though we will talk about that. But a specific event. A specific event within the Christian faith. And that is revival. Taking us to our main verse today. And our main verse today comes from the book of Psalm chapter 85 verse 6 so psalm 85 verse 6 from the amplified classic version tells us will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you that is our main verse today but there is so much verses out there i cannot understand how there are ministers there there are believers out there who claim that we don't actually have revival in the Bible. I mean, I, I can't understand that. Nevertheless, this is not a critique. This is not an attack on other denominations or other uh, um, branches of Christianity. On the contrary, today is a, is a really exciting topic that we're going to be talking about. It's something we've been waiting for a long time. And I believe with all the things that are going on in the world, not just the bad but today we're going to be highlighting the good and the amazing things that God is actually doing. But in order to highlight at least one specific one that's come to the top of, uh, of pretty much all the media, not just Christian media, but even secular media, we need to get to the, to the detailed or the definition, the understanding, the foundational understanding of what revival is. Amen? And the reality is the times that we're living in today calls, cries out, is hungry for revival. It is time for revival. It is time for revival. Now, what we're going to do today, I'm going to give you a context of what based on my experience, based on my studies, resources, things that I've been doing over the years as a minister, as a believer, as a brother in Christ, and what I see from the very Word of God. So I'll give you a context. I'm going to give you a definition of what revival is today. Then we're going to be talking about revival, or should I say, let me correct that. Then I'm going to make the statement, a definite statement that revival is imminent. Revival is imminent. And the third last thing that we're going to be touching on today is, of course, the thing that most Christians are talking about, and that is the Asbury Revival in Kentucky. And I'm talking about the 2023, this year's revival, because, yes, they've had revival before in the 1970s. But something special is happening this year in Asbury Revival. And... It's now, that fire is now spreading all over America and we must pray for that to come to Australia, for that same thing to happen. Not to, it's not so much as come, but for that same thing to happen in Australia. And I'll explain why, amen? 
Amen. All right. Are you ready for a powerful night? Because this is going to be very exciting, very interesting. It's going to reignite our passion, our zeal for revival, for the presence of God, for God to move in us and through us. After all, we have a mission, a commission that we must fulfill. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, move as you will this night. Have your way. Let the name of Jesus be glorified as we move through your word. And thank you, Lord, that it's all about you. It's all about you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is revival, you ask? Great question. Great question, because we hear about this all the time. And as I said before, Christianity has many branches, many denominations, and m many of them are very aware of what revival is. In fact, so much that they'll, they'll name, um, for example, worship nights, praise nights, word nights, Bible study nights as revival. Almost everything is revival. The word revival just seems to be used constantly in some branches, but there's other branches where it's gone completely the opposite, where they don't believe that there is revival, they don't believe that there's such thing as revival, or that it just stayed within the biblical times, and that there is no revival today. However, I want to tell you what the Bible says. I want to speak the truth. I want to teach the truth. I want to reveal the truth, as I understand it, from the Word of God. So what is revival, George? All right. Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon adequately defined it this way. The word revive wears its meaning upon its forehead. It is from the Latin and may be interpreted thus to live again, to receive again a life which has almost expired, to rekindle into a flame the vital spark which was nearly extinguished. Revival in the most simplistic forms, simplistic definition is a resuscitation, a resuscitation, a resuscitation. What is that, George? You're not entirely dead, but you're almost there. And then you get resuscitated back to full life. According to the Bible Gateway Dictionary, Revival is the bringing back of individuals to life, of vigor, both at the point of personal regeneration, uh, for example, in the Bible, uh, the woman at the well, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and other times in believers' lives, including a group setting, like the town of Nineveh. Remember Jonah? In the town of Nineveh. That's a great example. Now, I'll give you more Bible verses. Some Bible verses supporting this includes, but is not limited. And I'm going to give you quite a few so that you can go back and study for yourself. The following. Genesis 45 verse 27. 2 Samuel 22 verse 50. 2 Chronicles 33, 15 to 16. Job 22, 23, Psalm 19, verse 7, excuse me, Psalm 23, verse 3, Psalm 63, verse 1, Psalm 85, verse 6, Isaiah 38, verse 16, Jeremiah 17, verse 14, Daniel 4, 26, Haggai 1, 14, Acts 2, verse 37, to Timothy 1, verse 6, and Titus 3, 5 to 6. That's just a few. There's many in the Word of God. Now, Charles Finney, Charles Finney, a general of a revival, declared, A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. J.I. Packer explained it this way. Revival is the visitation of God which brings to life Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. Thence springs a vivid sense of sin 
and a profound exercise of heart in repentance, praise, and love with an evangelistic outflow. Wow. Wow. Certainly, that is what the times that we are living for right now is calling. Amen? This is what we need right now. It's basically Matthew 13, Matthew 13, 44 to 46. And I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Version. The kingdom of heaven is like something precious buried in a field, which a man found and hid again. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a dealer in search of fine and precious pearls who on finding a single pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. In the powerful, true words of Nancy Lee DeMoss, revival is not just an emotional touch. It's a complete takeover. Revival is not just an emotional touch. It's a complete takeover. Therefore, we can say, revival is imminent. Revival is imminent. Evan Roberts made this claim in the Wales, in the Welsh revival in 1904. My mission is first to the churches. When the churches are aroused to their duty, men of the world will be swept into the kingdom. A whole church on its knees is irresistible. Love that. Now, truth be told, we've entered a moment in history where the time for revival is desperately, desperately crying out to be actively fulfilled. Waiting for you and I to move in faith. Waiting for you and I to move in faith. Leonard Ravenhill stated a hard truth when he said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. Billy Sunday also made an interesting statement. When may a revival be expected? When the wickedness of the wicked grieves and distresses the Christian. Jonathan Go forth, accurately claimed, if a revival is being withheld from us, it is because some idols remain still enthroned. Because we still insist in placing our reliance in human schemes. Because we still refuse to face the unchangeable truth that is not by might, but by my spirit. And Andrew Murray made a fine conclusion when he said a true revival means nothing less than a revolution. Casting out the spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God and His love triumph in the heart and life. It's been said that in all the books of the Bible, only one has no end. Really? Yes. Only one has no end, and that is the book of Acts. Reason being, you and I. You and I, for we play a part in His victorious kingdom purpose, in the mission and fulfillment. And revival plays a key role in the journey You see, growing from glory to glory as living epistles, kings and priests, Christ ambassadors, soldiers of the living God, sons and daughters, we can rest assured His promise of revival is always on time, always enough, always fulfilled. When hopeless hunger meets hope in the time for revival. Let me say that again. Growing from glory to glory as living epistles, kings and priests, Christ ambassadors, soldiers of the living God, sons and daughters, we can rest assured. His promise of revival is always on time, always enough, always fulfilled when hopeless hunger meets hope 
in the time for revival. Now is the time for revival. Now is the time to be hungry. It is clear that our desperate times has birthed a critical need for a renewal, an awakening, a quickening, a refreshing, a revival. Call it what you like. And as scriptures and history shows, it all begins with the body of Christ. A revived church is a victorious church. Again, Charles Persian explains it perfectly when he stated, It is clear that the term revival can only be applied to a living soul, or to that which once lived. To be revived is a blessing which can only be enjoyed by those who have some degree of life. A true revival is to be looked for in the church of God. Only in the river of gracious life can the pearl of revival be found. It has been said that a revival must begin with God's people. This is very true. But it is not all the truth. For the revival itself must end as well as begin there. The results of the revival will extend to the outside world, but the revival, strictly speaking, must be within the circle of life. Wow. John R. Rice declared present-day wickedness, apostasy and modern civilization cannot prevent revival. Cannot prevent revival. We are in those times, people. We are in the time for revival. And no present-day wickedness, no apostasy, no modern civilization can prevent that. Why, you may say? Because even Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, 17-19, Matthew 16, 17-19, Upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell shall not prevail against it. Brothers and sisters, like Peter, we are the church. We are the church. And no wickedness, no apostasy, no modern civilization, no, I don't care, all the powers of hell will not prevail against us. This is his promise. And his promises are always fulfilled, always yes and amen. We were created, ordained, empowered for greatness, a supernatural divine kingdom mission, defeating the forces of darkness and releasing the kingdom of heaven on earth by spreading the good news to the world, accompanied with good works, his good works, by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4.6 reminds us, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Duncan Campbell, in the Lewis Awakening, declared, God is the God of revival, but man is the human agent through whom revival is possible. Again, Charles Persian. No wonder they called him the Prince of Preachers. Goes on to explain, while a true revival in its essence belongs only to God's people, it always brings with it a blessing for the other sheep who are not yet of the fold. If you drop a stone into a lake, the ring widens continually till the furthest corner of the lake fills the influence. Let the Lord revive a believer and, and very soon his family, his friends, his neighbors receive a share of the benefit. For when a Christian is revived, he prays more fervently for sinners. Longing, loving prayers for sinners is one of the marks of revival in the renewed heart. Since the blessing is asked for sinners, the blessing comes from him who hears the prayers of his people, and thus the world gains by revival. Hallelujah and Amen. Amen. Lord, we say Amen. 
Therefore, when we find ourselves burnt out, drained, hopeless at our end, His promise of revival kicks in. It's activated. It's made readily available for us. Our part is to take that hopelessness, that end, and relentlessly knock at the door of revival, where hope will answer and welcome us in. For as long as it takes, as long as we desire, as long as we are hungry for Him, encountering His goodness, His grace, His love, His glory, His power, His revelation, His refreshing, rejuvenating, transforming presence, reviving us onto a greater onto the greater things of God, greater effectiveness, greater revelation, greater influence and impact, greater love, greater power, and etc. Just as He promised. Bringing us to the Asbury revival of 2023. The Asbury, which is, let me say that proper, properly, Asbury University, Wilmore, Kentucky in USA, revival. So whatever, whatever view, whatever view you may take, and I'm not, and I'm not here to, to have theological arguments, you may take whatever view you want. But I'm going to talk about, as you just heard, about this revival, what is currently happening in Asbury, more specifically about my personal experience and deduction is this. Wait a second. What do you mean your personal experience? Give me a second and I'll explain. After hours of research, prayer and experience. And yes, I prayed. And I said, Lord, give me discernment. Help me to discern what is going on there. And I've prayed and I listened to hours of what was going on. They had lots of live feeds as well. This is my deduction. This is a revival. This is a true move. Without a doubt, a move of God. The perfect type of revival for such a time as this. As we see through scriptures and history, different times call for different measures. And likewise with revivals, these current times we find ourselves in. Deceitful, apathetic, lustful, wicked to the core has resulted in so much confusion, so much anger, bitterness, distrust, dehumanization, actions that has left us in a sense of hopelessness. It is clear that we need the grace of God more than ever before. And only the pure, loving, peaceful, forgiving, glory, power, revelation embodied in the amazing grace of God can revive us for such a time as this. Now, John R. Mott stated a necessary precursor for any great spiritual awakening or revival is a spirit of deep humiliation growing out of a consciousness of sin and fresh revelation of the holiness and power and glory of God. Ezra 9 verse 8 further reveals and reminds us. And now for a brief moment, grace has been shown us by the Lord our God, who has left a remnant to escape and has given us a secure hold in His holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. That is exactly what we see in the Asbury Revival. There is no main speaker, there is no famous worship leaders, no Christian celebrities whatsoever. Not even a schedule or a plan to follow, but pure hunger, desperation, a relentless group of young students zealous for a touch of God. Characterized by praise and worship, prayer, repentance, holiness, love, joy, generosity and obedience. A revival for such a time as this. Wow, you make us sound like it's perfect, George. How do you know that? Were you there? Well, in a sense, yes. I know they may sound weird to you, but... Yes, in a sense, yes. I wasn't there physically, but... 
Let me explain. I could truly share with you my experience, as I said before, in research, in prayer, listening. And my opinion, accompanied with all that we've covered today, is that this is definitely a move of God. Now, when I first heard, when I first heard of what was happening at Asbury University, and this was within the first few days, as a man of God myself, as a hungry believer, I quickly went on to YouTube, I went online to find out all that I could, which went on until just recently. I finally made a discerning deduction myself, and as I said, this is a move of God. A very special move of God, a revival. I knew I had to take into account, of course, let me explain this. I knew I had to take into account all that I had learned over the years about revival in Bible college, through church, and even serving as a participant in other revivalist ministries. Ministries like Global Awakening with Randy Clark. Ministries like Fresh Fire with Todd Bentley. Ministries like Kingdom Foundations with uh, Ravi in India. I knew I could not forget, first and foremost, that revival always seemed to be somewhat disorganized, unplanned, sudden, spirit-led, with a notable beginning and end. I was most definitely skeptic. I won't lie. At first, and so much so that I, <laughs> I wasn't even fully focused trying to multitask. I was doing two things at once whilst listening to the live feeds on YouTube until around 15 minutes. That's all it took, 15 minutes. And bam, it hit me like a ton of bricks. All of a sudden, God's presence became so tangible, so thick, so weighty in my room. It's like he just walked in the room. And I've had similar experiences before. Man, this was intense. This was, this was at a so much higher level. It was as if I was there myself. And I found myself not being able to resist. I mean, why would I? I dropped all that I was doing and I just felt myself bowing in awe and gratitude. A very strong sense of peace, joy, love, freedom, fulfillment, glory, faith. A deeper hunger and a passion and a zeal for His presence immediately cast out all of the other worries, all of the other thoughts, all of the other feelings and emotions. And I found myself weeping in thankfulness and hope for my life and for the world. Furthermore, there was something that for years, every now and then, would torment my thoughts. Consequently, this would wear me out until I got touched by the Asbury revival. I can clearly say that because I know it happened. Specifically, the grace of God. I know, I, don't, I didn't just feel it. I know, I am completely free, delivered in a moment with God. A supernatural revelation, a renewing of the mind, a transforming moment of freedom. Oh man, thank you, Jesus. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we should be looking for revival in the sense of like chasing revival everywhere as an event. But as we heard today, as we discussed today, as we've seen today through biblical evidence, through history. This is part of the mission. This is part of our mission. A soldier in a war every now and then has to come back and get refitted with new weaponry, with new um, armor, uh, has to eat, has to sleep, has to rest. In a sense, in the most simplistic sense, that is what happens in revival with us. In our mission, in our journey, we get, we get overwhelmed, we get run over, we lose track, we lose focus. And it's in those times where we think, oh, well, if you don't come now, Lord, 
I'm done for. And bam, he shows up. He shows up and he revives us. We need that. He's so good. He's so good. As a brother waiting in line at Asbury University stated, I believe you can't be effective until you've been affected. So true. For me, it lasted just a few minutes. I thought it would have been at least an hour. It was only a few minutes or so. And I can most definitely say that I've been affected to be more effective. Ten minutes around that much. Ten minutes is all it took. Can you imagine how more God can do if we press in longer? If we remain in His glorious, His reviving presence until we are refilled to pour out onto the world? I pray that what you've heard today has stirred you, reignited, rekindled that fire within you, that zeal for revival, that more of God and less of us. I say more, Lord. I say I want more. I need more. I need revival. We say, Lord, we want more. We need more. We want more revival. As Charles Persian so eloquently said, we must feed anew by faith upon the flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus. And so the Holy Ghost will recruit our strength and give us a revival. Amen and amen. Allow me to conclude as we began with God's word. Psalm 85 verse 6, our main verse today. Will you not revive us again? That must be our cry every day. Will you not revive us again, Lord? That your people may rejoice in you. He has not forsaken you. He has not forsaken us. He's always with us. He knows just at the right time. We cannot organize revival, but we can set our sails to catch the wind of heaven. It is time for revival, brothers and sisters. I don't know if you're watching us for the first time here tonight, or this morning, or this afternoon, wherever you're from. But as you can see on the screen, this is not a coincidence. This is a divine moment with God. And right now, all you need to do is cry out to the Lord. He's real. He's so real. He's so in love with you. God wants you. Jesus has got you and the Holy Spirit is for you. Romans 10, 9 to 10 tells us very simply what you must do if you have not made the Lord Jesus your Lord and Savior. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. And the word of God goes on to say in many other verses, it doesn't stop there. Once you are saved, what happens? Well, Titus 3 verse 5 tells us, then he saved us. Not because we were good enough to be saved, but because of his kindness and his pity or Better yet, His love, His mercy, His grace. By washing away our sins and giving us the new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Oh, there you go, George, again, without word, sin. Sin in the most simplistic form is when we try to live our lives without God. That is a sin because you were created in His image. You were created for Him. You know, you are the only creation. Out of everything built, uh, created in the universe that is created in God's image. We are the only thing, the only creation. Most, In fact, his word says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship, his most prized possession, his unique masterpiece created unto good works. He created us in his image. And then He entrusted us, He authorized us, He ordained us, He empowered us to rule over the creation. Wow, how much love does he have for us to do such thing? And he doesn't give up on us. Even when we try to live without him, even when we sin by living without him, he doesn't give up. 
He comes. And when you ask Him to come into your life, to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, to help you, to guide you through your life, to be your Lord, He gives us the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire, which means the very Spirit of God, God Himself will come and live inside of you. Live inside of you. You become His temple, His synagogue, His church, His inmost indwelling place. Indwelling means that where He will live inside of you. He will guide you. He will protect you. He will teach you. He will correct you. He will love on you. He will comfort you. And He will also teach you how to use the fire that He comes with, which represents power and authority and the spiritual gifts that He brings. And we're going to do that right now. We're going to pray together. Now, the matter of the heart is the heart of the matter. So in another words, as you heard before in Romans 10, 9 to 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Some of you, you can do that yourselves. But if you're nervous or you need some help, you can, you can repeat after me. There's no generic prayer, but you can repeat after me. And then we're going to ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. And God's going to come down and He's going to baptize you. Are you ready? We'll do this together. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful privilege to pray with my brother and sister. And we know, Lord, that when we cry out to you, that you hear us. So now, Lord, listen to our cry. And you can repeat after me. From this day forward... Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior. Wash me clean of all the sin. Cleanse me. Make me a new creation. I believe God raised you from the dead. And now, I am victorious in Christ Jesus. From this day forward, Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we ask you, Lord, that you fall upon your children right now. As Jesus breathed the breath of life over the apostles, Lord, I breathe your life over them right now. In Jesus' name, receive the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God tells us that as they received the Holy Spirit, that there was manifestations and one of the signs was speaking in other tongues. It will sound like gibberish. You, you will feel like something weird in your mouth, like in your tongue. But just open your mouth and you will begin to speak a holy spiritual language that connects you so close to God. It, it, it just goes straight to God and, and you. It's a holy language that also strengthens you, your body, spirit, and soul. You'll just begin to open your mouth just by faith. And you'll start speaking the language of the Lord. Others will feel other symptoms. You may feel a heat very hot through your body. You may feel like electricity is running through you. You may feel like a massive weight just lifted off you. You may even feel like you've just been healed. And I don't mean just feel. You'll know that you've been healed of a specific sickness. You may even just just feel a, a, an incredible amount of joy. Some of you are probably just laughing and you just can't stop. Like, what is happening to me? It's the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I want to welcome you back to the kingdom family. Please, please, heaven, the, the Word of God tells us that heaven rejoices for every soul that returns. I want to encourage you to get connected with the church. Church is unperfect because you and I, we are the church. And we are all growing in the likeness of Christ. However, He created us for the family, for the kingdom of God, for Him. But we are created to cooperate with each other, to live within the kingdom of God. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, well, it's, it's the church, which is considered as the body of Christ, 
that is meant to be united, that is meant to work together to fulfill the Great Commission, to fulfill the mission that God's given each and every single one of us, that has given to the church. And we must help each other out. The church is there so that we can serve each other, so that we can learn from each other in many, many different things that God wants to do. It's with through the body of Christ, through the church. So get connected with a Bible-teaching, Holy Spirit-filled church. This is the time. This is the time for revival. And you get the honor. You get the honor of being part of it. Glory to God, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful, wonderful night. We thank you for the rest of this night, Lord Father God. This brings us to our second part of the program is, is what we call the collective, where I spend time with those that are listening, those that are watching, and I pray, prophesy, whatever the Holy Spirit leads me to do. Um, if you have any specific prayers, make sure you write them down in the Facebook live chat section as well. Write them in advance because sometimes it takes a while for it to kick in and to, to come up. I encourage you, if you're new, stay around. Drop us a line. I gave my life to Jesus today. I'm from wherever you are. You may even be from Asbury, Kentucky. Maybe you're from whatever, Alabama. Maybe you're from Bhutan. Maybe you're from Nepal. Wherever you're from, it's always an, an encouragement for us as well to know that there's brothers and sisters out there that are being touched by the living Word of God. Amen? Amen. That brings us to... The Collective!